Now, I don't know about you, but Jonah cracks me up. It's a hilarious story. I mean, I think I like Jonah, and I find him so funny, because he's just so real. Here he is, a prophet called by God to go preach a message, and he does what is probably the most sensible thing to do when God tells you to go somewhere and do something. He runs the absolute other direction. I mean, Jonah hears the word from God and says, you know what, I'm going to flee, I'm going to get on a boat, I'm going to go to Tarshish, maybe God will forget about me, maybe God won't be able to find me. But we know that's not the case. We know God finds Jonah, and Jonah goes through some mishaps, and there's a storm while he's on the boat, and Jonah says, you know what, it'd be better just throw me in the ocean, just throw me in the sea. It'd be better to be in the sea than to go to Nineveh. And then this big fish comes and swallows Jonah and spits him up on the beach. And finally Jonah says, all right, all right, I'll go. So he walks all the way to Nineveh. He goes into the middle of the city and gives his message and asks the people to repent. And he leaves. That's it. And he is convinced that these people don't deserve salvation. They're not going to repent. And he's going to go up and he's going to sit on this hill and watch God destroy the city because that's what they deserve. But of course, God doesn't destroy the city because God has mercy on the people because all of them repented. When Jonah came and gave his message, the people listened. And they repented of their sins. Well, this was displeasing to Jonah. He was not very happy. He's so upset, he's like, Oh, it would be better to die than to not see these people destroyed. And he's just complaining. And so he sat there, sitting on this hill, and God says, You know, let me appoint a bush to grow and give shade and comfort to Jonah. And so this bush grows and gives him shade and comfort, and Jonah's sitting there, he's comfortable, and he's enjoying this. He's like, oh, I kind of like this bush. This is nice. Still not happy that Nineveh is still there, but I'm going to sit here and I'm going to enjoy the shade for a bit. Well, then another day goes by. And God says, well, now I'm going to appoint a worm to attack the bush and destroy it. And overnight, the bush is gone. And then the next day, Jonah gets up and the bush is not there. Oh, I'm so angry. I would rather die than not have my bush give me shade. And God says, Jonah, is it right for you to be this angry about not having the bush there? And Jonah's like, oh, yes, I'm angry enough to die. He's just whining and complaining. He sounds kind of like a teenager. Not that any of the teenagers here would ever complain like this. I'm sure the parents of these teenagers will tell you that they never complain like Jonah complained. But that's the story of Jonah. It just ends. There's no real resolution, but there's Jonah who's complaining because God had mercy on other people. And Jonah didn't feel they deserved God's mercy. And sometimes we're a bit like Jonah. Sometimes we get upset when we feel that God doesn't punish the people that we think need to be punished. We have a similar story from the Gospel, where Jesus tells the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And there are people who worked all day, and people who worked some of the day, and people who only worked an hour, and they all got paid the same daily wage. And the people who worked all day are upset, because 
They thought that when they saw the people who worked only an hour get paid the daily wage, that those who'd worked all day would get paid more. But then they weren't paid more. Now they're upset. They grumble against this landowner. You have made these people equal to us. We were the ones who bore the burden of the day. We were the ones who were in the scorching heat. Not them. Why would you give them the same that you give us? It's not fair. Why? And they're upset. Because this landowner has given away freely his own gifts. The landowner says this wonderful phrase, Are you envious because I'm generous? Which is a wonderful phrase on its own, but I actually like the Greek a bit better because if you literally translate the Greek, it, it reads more like, Is your eye evil because I am generous? Is your eye evil? And we know from earlier in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus says that the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is good, if your eye is clear, then light shines from you, from this lamp of your body, and you see the good in the world. But if your eye is darkened, if you have it, an evil eye, you see only the bad. See, sometimes we have that evil eye. We have that evil eye when we look at celebrities, athletes, and we say, really, they, they're just playing a game of football, and they get millions of dollars a year? What I do as a priest is so much more important than some game that people play. Why do they get millions of dollars and I don't even get close to six figures? This is ridiculous. But then, that's me having an evil eye. Because the truth of the matter is this. It doesn't matter how much a football player makes. It doesn't matter how much celebrities make. Because what they make has no bearing on whether or not I can serve God. It has no bearing on whether or not I can do the work that God has given me to do. So why do I fret and worry or care about what they make? It's only if my eye is evil and I'm focused so hard on the wrong, on the darkness, on the bad, on those people who make more money than I feel they should, on those people who aren't punished when I feel they should be punished, that I'm affected. But if my eye is good, then I see that God has given me, given me all that I need. So my prayer for you is that you can have an eye that is good. That you can let go of those cares and worries about the things that don't matter. Because what an athlete makes, what a celebrity makes in a year, has no bearing on what you can do for the kingdom of God. So let's not have evil eyes. Let's have good eyes that shine forth the light of Christ and recognize that all else doesn't matter. So let our eyes be good. And let's serve our God and ignore whatever else would distract us. 
then we will be living a life worthy of the gospel that St. Paul asks us to do in today's epistle. Let's not have evil eyes simply because God is generous. Let's not have evil eyes simply because God doesn't punish those that we feel should be punished. Let's have good eyes and see only the light in our world. Oh, hey, fellas, I'm trying to give somebody evil eye over there. Would you mind breaking it up so I can... You understand. Thanks, fellas. Very nice of you. Appreciate it. Thank you.